Hi, I'm Emmy Victor, and this is Energizing the Economy. As states across America look for ways to boost their economies post-COVID-19, many are looking to their energy policies as a catalyst. But are states using all of their energy resources to the fullest potential? To discuss this issue is former U.S. Congressman from California, John Doolittle. Hi, John, and welcome to the program. Hi, Emmy. Nice to be with you. You spent over 20 years representing California, first as a state senator and then later in Washington as a member of Congress. How has the state's energy mix changed and which policies have most significantly contributed to the current state of California's energy troubles? Well, for as long as I can remember, California has had abundant energy and it's been wonderful. Uh, it's changed somewhat now with the, uh, well, two major developments. One, uh, fracking, which produced massive amounts of natural gas <coughs> and uh, oil. The, uh, the gas has been, you know, a, a wonderful addition to the mix. Right about the same time as the natural gas came along, why California really began to take the lead in renewables of solar and wind power. And um, so the two kind of uh, went hand in hand. And I remember in our district, a number of the communities were building natural gas fired plants. And it just, you know, it was a tremendous asset. It was a very clean burning fuel. So positive for the environment. It was a constant source of power when needed. And since renewables are not constant, you have to have uh, a backup with constant power. So I think that's the, uh, those are sort of the, the change in, in the mix over the years. Speaking about solar, California leads the country in solar hosting over one third of all of it in the U.S. This is a stat that the state political leadership openly touts. So with that in mind, how does California's continued inability to provide consistent power to its residents point to a deficiency not only with solar, but with renewables in general? Well, renewables are inherently intermittent, as I said, and, and by that I mean that the solar produces power when the sun is shining. When it doesn't shine, there's no power. Uh, wind produces power when the wind is blowing. When there's no wind, there's no power. What you get now is, uh, in the summer especially, massive amounts of power being generated while the sun is shining more than, than is needed. And that has to be shipped off to other jurisdictions who might need it because we have an excess and we have an inability to store it. That's why it's intermittent. At night, it's still hot and there's still high power demands, but now we don't have the solar generating power. And the result is that we have a power deficit and somehow we have to make up for that. We've been making up for that with these natural gas plants and, and other sources of power, but primarily natural gas. And now those are threatened uh, by laws that were enacted in California that's going to force the complete elimination of natural gas as a source by 2045. So this is a problem. We need instead to allow the natural gas to continue to complement the renewables. We're proud of all of them and they work well together. If you cut off though one of the arms and you only have one, it's not going to work. So that's my observation about the, why we're in the mess that we're in. Let's talk about the blackouts. How have they impacted residents of California? With one of the highest poverty rates in the country, how are California's most vulnerable being impacted by the state's progressive energy posture? Well, the most vulnerable seem to suffer the first in these situations, but everyone suffers, really. And when you don't have power, you know, you're back in the 19th century, essentially. That means no air conditioning, no refrigeration, no use of electricity for any purpose. And so much of what we use involves electricity. Uh, is when is the poor, of course, uh, suffer first and, and uh, well, more well-to-do people have alternatives they can create uh, if necessary. But the poor have no alternative. They need to be able to flip the light switch on and have it go on. And if it doesn't, then, uh, you know, they don't have any good alternatives. So I feel like 
the policies need to change. You can just imagine when you don't have power, why well, you can do very little. We all are dependent upon the internet and uh, television and uh, radio and all of these things. They all take power. So it changes the way we live and, and uh, it changes, uh, you know, if you can't operate your office equipment, why uh, you have to close your office. So in all senses, it's bad. It impacts the economy. And with loss of food through the loss of refrigeration, that kind of thing, there's, there's a lot of costs involved. California is often positioned as a test bed when it comes to progressive policies. Are you concerned that the state's unsustainable energy policies are being exported or marketed to other states? And what impacts could it have nationally? Well, we are a test bed and the tests for eliminating natural gas and just relying upon renewables, I'd say these rolling blackouts are indications of a test failure. And people should sit up and take notice and, and not wish to export Cal or import California's energy policies to the rest of the nation. Congressman, some would argue that natural gas in particular has served the state well. There are several natural gas plants in the coastal regions that were slated to close, but in the face of the blackouts, the government is now considering allowing some of those natural gas plants to remain operational. Do you agree with this? And do you see a future for natural gas in California? The first policy change that I would make would be the one you just mentioned, not shutting down the coastal natural gas plants that are currently in operation. I see a, a long future for natural gas. I don't see how we're going to be able just to rely 100% on renewables. That's gonna depend upon the development of technologies that don't presently exist. I think uh, given the abundance and, and the low price of natural gas, uh, it, it's a great blessing for the people of this country, speaking of the poor, you know, to have the ability to take advantage of our abundance of that particular natural resource, which is very clean as a source and is abundant and which meets our needs. We have to have something. And right now it would be natural gas. John, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Thank you. And I hope you'll all join us next time for our series, Energizing the Economy.